Well, uh, I want to make the light here. How's that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Here we go. It's on. Yeah. <coughs> How's technology? Our time with it. Um, I, I, I'd like to start out by thanking you all um, for coming um, and spending your Sunday afternoon here. Um, considering it's such a beautiful day outside, I, I myself would be debating on whether I'd want to do a lecture um, at this time of day. But uh, I certainly do appreciate the fact that you're here. <coughs> So I'll just get started. And we'll have time for uh, questions and answers at, um, at the end of the presentation. And I'll be signing books at the table back here. And so uh, if we run out of a little bit of time, if you still want to talk to me about a few things, that I'll be signing books and I'll be glad to talk to you then also too. Um, and I also have some um, condor paraphernalia, for lack of a better term, that, that I think that you ought to check out. It's, it's pretty, pretty impressive. I don't know how much uh, you folks know about the California condor, but I'll start out with a, so, uh, a minor biological um, lesson. The California condor, Gymnogyps um, California, Anis, is the largest free-flying bird in North America, and arguably one of the most endangered. The wingspan of a California condor approaches 10 feet. You see a pair of California condors there down to the, on, the, on the lower left. The bird on the upper right is a golden eagle. A golden eagle has a wingspan of just a little over six feet. So you get a, just a size perspective of this bird. It's a huge, huge bird. Um, uh, when I first started in this business, I used to use the analogy that uh, the California condors were the B-52 of the bird world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, however, that, that plane is been here and gone, <laughs> and younger audiences don't get that joke. <laughs> Not that you're an elderly audience, I wouldn't find that at all. Um, so any basketball fans, you must be excited. Yeah. Uh, the, all right, the NBA season has started and everybody's out there. Well, um, just for some more perspective, that rim, basketball rim, is 10 feet off the ground. So if you were to take a California condor and hang him from the edge of that rim, his, his wing tips would just miss the floor. I just give you an idea just how big these birds are. It's, it's almost unreal. They stand about three and a half feet high, and they weigh um, about 20 pounds, plus or minus. So if any of you guys have ever uh, loved in that 20 pound frozen turkey at Thanksgiving, <laughs> you probably have done that this weekend, right? i give you an idea just how heavy these guys are. Um, that bird on the left is a turkey vulture. It's not a small bird. Uh, the bird on the uh, right, lower right there is a, a raven, not a small bird either. And this California condor just dwarfs those, uh, those two other uh, carrion eaters. I've um, either been fortunate or not fortunate, however you look at it, to handle condors uh, during my career working with them. And, uh, I always say it's equivalent to wrestling a turkey on steroids. <laughs> They're very, very strong. And even though they don't have talons, um, they can do a lot of damage with their feet. Uh, their beak is their primary weapon. All right. But a bird of that size was the norm. If you go back 11,000 years to the Pleistocene epoch, the heyday of the California condor, the California condor, uh, back during the Pleistocene, benefited from this mega mammalian fauna in the form of uh, saber-toothed tigers, woolly mammoths, uh, mastodons, giant ground sloths. So there wasn't a lack of carrion on the North American landscape, and therefore you could find condors throughout North America, and we know that from the fossil record. Unfortunately, and, and you, I'll probably know, the, these large mammals suffered a climatic extinction. The weather turned cold, there was an ice flow from the north, and all these large mammals couldn't move and couldn't adjust fast enough that they all went extinct. And it's probably a good thing, because I don't know if we want to be in a, have said two tigers in our backyard. But the California condor, before it could, because it could fly, moved was able to move to the coast, to the west coast, and where, where the ocean tempered 
the, the, uh, the climate and they were able to survive on the west coast and, uh, and, and, and survive that climatic extinction that took the, uh, their food source, the, uh, the primary food source. And uh, what's very, very interesting is that the same condor that existed during the Pleistocene is the same species uh, that uh, flies over the skies of the Grand Canyon today. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's what's called a temporal subspecies by scientists, and that just means that over time it's changed just a bit, but it's the exact bird. Isn't that amazing? So, the California condor was able to fly through history, leave a landscape with saber-toothed tigers to modern times, only to run into man, which presented him with his second challenge. And that was to survive persecution. Um, man shot, uh, poisoned his environment, poisoned individual birds, put chemicals into the environment, uh, modified the environment, all of which brought the California condor to extinction in the wild, um, uh, a near extinction, because we were able to uh, bring some condors into captivity and save the species. <clears throat> So even though the California condor, again, was able to survive out of the Pleistocene, the modern times, unfortunately, due to man's um, lack of sensitivity for the creatures in his natural world, almost came, became extinct in modern times. But as all we know, it, it survived, and uh, any of you that follow the, uh, the condor uh, reintroduction program in the, in the Grand Canyon, uh, there's currently 78 condors flying free in the Grand Canyon. Uh, six of those birds were fledged uh, from wild nests within the Grand Canyon. The total population now is about 358 individuals. 189 of those are in the wild. That's throughout its range. That includes Baja, Mexico, and uh, in California, of course. <clears throat> so. And uh, when you consider that in 1982, the population dropped to only 22 individuals, um, it's, it's a remarkable comeback. It's a, remar it's, a, it's a remarkable story. However, as remarkable as that story is, and, and, and as compelling as it is, I'm going to tell a different story this afternoon, an equally compelling story, and that is the story of the California condor and Native Americans. Native Americans have always maintained a very unique relationship with the animals in their natural world. It was this natural, it was this relationship that helped form uh, their manner of worship, um, ceremony, um, spiritual beliefs, their dances, their songs, their legends. But there existed a very special relationship between Native Americans and the California condor. Native Americans revered the largest flying bird in their natural world. And this bird played a very significant part in their lives and their cultures. And evidence of this importance is, um, is still uh, available to us in the form of oral legends, um, ceremonies, dances, songs, and even intangible things like rock art in, in caves. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a little bit of that with you and uh, hopefully illustrate it with some slides that you'll find uh, equally entertaining. Uh, an example of the importance of the California condors to Native American cultures. In California, there are approximately 60 uh, major tribes, and those tribes uh, have at least 65 known names for the California <coughs> condor. Uh, Moloko, Ami, Wit, Ho Ho are just a few, and you'll hear more as uh, I uh, proceed in my pres 